Welcome to a Masters at Work Christmas special. If you missed part one, make sure you click here to watch it first and make sure you don't go any further until you do. Good. In part two, James is going to arrange what he's recorded as well as add in some initial processing to the drum tracks. Hope you enjoy it and if you want to learn more about mixing and mastering your tracks, make sure you check out our courses at pointblanklondon.com. Welcome. Okay, we've seen how the SP1200 really crunches things up using 12-bit technology and all of those old analog converters, but that's pretty much impossible for everyone to be able to use. Um, but what I have discovered is there's a great new little plug-in made by Tau that are very famous for putting th um, the kind of Juno copies and the chorus plugins together. Uh, that emulates all of the old original sample chips and could be really useful. So, I'll give you a quick example. Here's a really pristine uh, 16th shaker part. And we want to kind of give that some of that dirt that we were feeling from the SP1200. Um, so, here's the sampler. It's dead easy. I'm literally just going to pick this up and drop it straight in there. And this is what I find fantastic about this, is that you can literally drag and drop from any part of your DAW screen um, and it's all set to go. I've already got a, a little one note trigger here. Now that sounds fine. Let's put it into emulator 2 mode and start to muck around with the sample rate, the offset and some of these controls that will kind of emulate the problems that digital systems have like jitter. Now here's our original, nice and pristine. Here's our now effectively old school emulated shaker loop. And we should be able to slot that straight in to the other bits and pieces that have come off from the SP1200. Now it could do with some timing work. But that just gives you a kind of idea of what's, what, it, what it's possible here. Um, it's also you can emulate some of the other types of digital to analog converters that were around in the 80s. It's fantastic for fitting anything with high-end information in to anything that you're working on where you kind of want a future retro sound. And it's odd, isn't it? We're sat around all of this brand new technology and all we try to do is spend half of our lives trying to make everything sound old. So let's... Just bounce that down. I'm just going to quickly freeze that so we can pull the plug in out. And I'm just going to use Ableton's little delays down here in this right hand column just to pull this in and out. So let's just now make a very quick kind of static balance between our housey part and our 808 part. Obviously it's quite dramatic at the moment. Let's get these worked up. Okay, now the first thing we're gonna look at is just this 808 kick. Now, as you saw, that came pretty much raw out of an 808, and it's going to sound very odd coming out from the um, SP1200 kick. So we're going to need to do some quite heavy processing to get it actually to sit. Now, for 808s, or particularly anything that you need to start to get some uh, weight and some power into, using parallel processing inside of Ableton or any one of the DAWs is without doubt the best possible way. And the theory goes like this, that you have a completely dry signal that you're sending with another channel right next to it, and that channel or that part of your, uh, your sound rack in this case actually has the processing on it. So instead of placing, for example, a compressor straight on the original sound, you're having a compressed version of your sound come up right next to it, and then you have full control over it. And let me show you how to do that in Ableton. It's dead simple. I'm gonna take the compressor, drop it straight onto the channel and go fairly crazy with the settings.
Now that's not the kind of compression you may want on your sound um, actually as it is, but look what happens when you start uh, to put it actually in parallel. So to do that, I'm gonna click on the compressor and hit group. That will put it into an audio effect rack. Uh, let's rename this single chain here, comp. And then I'm gonna right click or control click on the, uh, the area here just underneath the rack where it says drop audio effects and create chain. Now this will create two completely separate audio streams within that one channel. One of them is gonna be heavily compressed and the other one is gonna be completely dry. So let me just mark this one up as dry. Now, because they're containing the same audio, there's a little bit of theory that you have to know here. If you're adding two sources together, uh, you need to drop both of them by 6 dB. So for example, if you had two kick drums identical to each other in the same stream, they would suddenly jump in level. If you bring both of those channels down by 6 dB, they will be exactly as it was before. So I'm just gonna drop both of these minus six. And now let's just hear both of these channels individually. So this is the completely dry, as it was. This is our overly compressed version. And I'm just gonna take, up, take off the makeup gain there and level it manually. Neither of them are particularly inspiring until you start to add them together. And now let's add a little bit of EQ in parallel. I'm gonna bring the level right down. So this is my third chain on here. And I'm gonna go quite heavy handed with the mid range. It tends to work on 808. And now let's do the same for some of the other sounds. So we'll bring the snare in next. And the key to 808 snare is always the ambience that you put onto it. So I'm gonna dive into Max for Live for Ableton here because it has the brilliant convolution reverb on it, which is just more fun than you can possibly imagine. And if you dive into its uh, menus here, there are a couple that are specifically made for drums and do what they say on the tin. Let's see what we can find. So I've just used the dry and wet control there, uh, but what I do want to do is try and create a, a gated reverb sound. Uh, I've got a couple of options here, but one thing I didn't even think about you could do in Ableton is you can use a gate and then sidechain it from itself. It's just an audio stream that will pick it up. So instead of using the dry and wet control on this snare, I'm gonna turn it 100% wet and then use our parallel system that we just did on the kick. So let's group this. So there you go, 100% wet there. Rename the channel so that we don't get confused. I'm going to create a dry chain underneath and just call this dry. And then just grab Ableton's built-in gate and drop it onto the reverb channel. Open up this little triangle which will give you the sidechain controls and I'm going to sidechain it from itself. Now what this will do is it will trigger the gate from the dry sound, which is a kind of clever way of tricking the reverb into being gated by itself. You can hear a bit of the reverb coming in there. Now we're gonna use the hold control just to open it out. There you go, instant gated reverb. Don't think that you just have to have a reverb and that's it, muck with it. Stick a saturator on it afterwards. Uh, anything you want, even just, uh, let's, I'll show you one thing that often does work, and we may use here. We'll feed a little bit of the simple delay there you go. Uh, if you turn both of these sync buttons off, the timings here don't matter and we can just actually dial in uh, an actual kind of arbitrary time. So now we're just feeding a tiny bit of delay into the reverb, which will really help. Just widen things up. 
So this is our snare drum before. Nice, but don't do much. But as soon as you start to put ambience onto it, uh, that's when everything starts to come together. And it's the same pretty much with most of the 808 sounds. So to save time, I'm just gonna quickly grab exactly the same reverb that we've got there onto our rim. Now, if you think about particularly classic old records, they were mixed on desks where people were using auxiliary. So often the same reverbs were actually used. Um, you may ask, why am I not using this on auxiliaries? It's because at any point, if I'm applying them to the channels, it allows me just to bounce them down. And it's something I love doing, actually making the decision and, and bouncing the audio down and freezing it so that it's actually there and uh, with all effects applied. But when you play the rim back, something weird is going on with the reverb. And what's happening is our gate, uh, when you copy a gate in any channel in Ableton, it won't change your side chains. And this is the kind of thing that if you're not sure about in Ableton can drive you absolutely up the wall and take you ages to kind of work out. Our reverb is being gated still from the snare drum because I've copied the effect. So I'm just gonna reset the gate to the actual channel that we're working on. There we go. And there is another beauty of having these controls set up in this manner. Um, if, say, I wanted to actually increase the amount of reverb over time, I have full control over it here. So if I wanted to do an automation rise just on the second part here of this rim, I can just grab the channel volume and hook it up with automation. Great little tricks, anything like that that will keep your fairly static rhythms actually showing some difference will always make things work. One thing I do want to really show you is how ambience can be useful on kick drums. Um, the analog circuit of an 808 is incredibly pure and it's just pumping out effectively a kind of like a processed uh, and envelope controlled pitched sine wave, uh, which is great, but sometimes they can be incredibly pure. And if you think about how the world actually works, nothing is pure, everything's got a tiny bit of reverb on it. So when you've got pure sound, sometimes adding small amounts of ambience um, just will give it a kind of more realistic feel in our actual head. Because as I say, the, only when you walk into an anechoic chamber, which is one of those weird rooms with all of the stuff on the walls, do you never hear any reflections. That's the only time. Every other time in your life, you will be hearing reflections from a room. So even the smallest bit of ambience can help to actually bed things in. So once again, we've got our gate, our gate problem. So I'm just gonna flip the side chain here to the kick. You should be able to hear, if I turn this off, and now put it on. For some reason to us as humans, it just sounds a little bit weird because the reverb's allowing us to have a kind of positional information on it. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly whip through the rest of these drum sounds. Um, and then we'll come back and listen to how far we've got. Okay, so I've just done a couple of little extra bits of processing on our 808 section. Uh, one of them that may seem quite weird is I've got a little bit of reverb on some of the 808 hats. And bearing in mind, this all comes from an analog synth. So they all can be very bright. And sometimes when it's totally dry, it can just seem a bit weird in the ears. So by putting tiny bits of ambience around can just help to bed things in. Let me show you what I mean. Here they are dry. And this is what I've added. Now it's a very, it's only using Ableton's built-in reverb, but once you actually tweak it, you can get some quite good stuff out of it. It's very, very short. And there's just enough to help it on its way there. And we've got just a little ping pong delay on uh, the open hat there. Now, I'm not using anything that's particularly posh on this. I want to kind of show you that even though we've used posh sound sources here, um, we can actually build up quite a good little balance using just the internal tools that come with the software. So now let's skip over to our house section. And I've just done a tiny bit of editing on the kick drum just to kind of make sure it's bang on the money each time. And this is where we are. Okay, the first thing I want to look at quickly is just the kick drum. And I want to use a little bit of parallel compression just to keep some of it under control a little bit. Um, I've actually already set it up and you can see here we've got a compressed channel. 
Now that's quite heavy compression for a kick drum. You wouldn't want that completely on your sound as it stands, but when you run it in parallel with a dry channel, it just helps to keep some of the actual low end information, the real sub under control a little bit, as well as adding just a nice little uh, knock to the front of the transient and bringing that out. Um, let's go on to the loop that we got out of the SP1200. And look down here, you can see all of this wonderful sub stuff that's come in from the thickness of the converters, even though that actual sound doesn't have much sub on it. Um, but I'm gonna to want to take the real low end of that off, so I'm just gonna roll some of that up there. And there's a few things in the way. I just wanna look at this loop that we put through the little rolling box. We'll take some of the bottom end off that. So let's just have a quick look at what's going on. Not too bad. Give it a little bit of a lift. Now the next sound I really wanna look at is this ride symbol that we got off the TR8. And this is where I want to show you some of the emulations that I like to use uh, of using digital EQs, even just the internal ones inside Ableton, to try and emulate some of the, the moves I might make on hardware. And the first thing that I always like to try and teach people when it comes to EQ is when you're using EQs either at the top or the bottom, which obviously we're going to be do, doing some shelf EQ at the top with this ride, is to use them always in tandem with a, um, a low pass filter. So I'm going to use band 8 of Ableton's EQ here. And here we go, we've got a controllable filter. And I'm going to kind of fit this around the waveform of the sound. And we can use the Q control there just to open it up. Now you can see from the Neve EQ that we actually kind of got a little bit of natural roll off. And I'm just gonna add a little bit more before I make the, the main EQ move. Now I can EQ in a broad shelf into that actual filter. To get some nice top end sizzle, but without it kind of going ballistic up the top here. Let's just level it down a bit. So you can automatically hear the difference that it's making. But let me just quickly show you. Uh, if you're listening on headphones, you'll probably hear this a lot easier. Let me show you now what happens now if I take the filter off and the difference between um, that broad EQ move. Now in isolation, sounds like that can sound beautifully bright, but particularly if you're working on something that's got a slightly old school vintage vibe, you may want to tame some of those frequencies. And learning that relationship between the, uh, the gains of a shelf filter and its respective uh, pass filter, uh, here at the low pass filter, is one of the best skills that you can learn in EQing. Now let's just look at our clap. We're gonna to want to fatten this up a little bit. And I want to introduce you now to what I consider to be one of the best plugins for a very, very low quantity of money. This is uh, Fielding DSP's Reviver, and it basically adds harmonics. So very simple, input and output slider. The output slider will be useful because we're going to be adding extra harmonics into this, and obviously it's going to get louder. I don't really tend to touch the second harmonic slider. That will kind of give it a bite, uh, the kind of thing you'd get from a transistor distortion circuit. But this third harmonic slider here just seems to make everything sound better. And let me show you exactly what I mean as I turn it up on this clap. Now let's level it back again. So this is before. And this is after. And it just adds a kind of thickness, which is exactly the kind of thing that it's emulating. Um, either to kind of transformer circuits or valve circuits will generate third harmonic distortion. So you can see that even with a cheap plug-in like that, because that's only about $29, you can start to emulate some of the sounds that you can get from the high-end equipment. And particularly when it comes to drums, it's basically uh, always a exercise in controlled distortion. 
Now let me show you what it can do to a kick because it always sounds great at thickening up kicks. So this is before with no processing. And I'm just going to dial some of the third harmonic in and listen to it fatten up. And we'll pull it back a touch there just to level it. And then fit that in. And I've got to say, I've not found one bass line or one kick drum that doesn't uh, come alive a little bit more with a little touch of that. So as I say, for $29, it's an absolute steal. Now, you can hear we've got quite an awkward transition as we come out of the house bit into the actual 808. Now, I find the moment you've got drums going, particularly if you've already built two sections as we, are, as we have here, the best thing you can possibly do, and you can do it incredibly quickly, is to start copying these things around and start arranging. So I'm just going to copy the entire drum thing to the front. So we're going to have a little break down here, another main section, maybe two more main sections, and then maybe another break here, and then we'll go into the 808 a little bit later on. And quite simple techniques here. All I'm doing is really copying all of the blocks, and then I'll go through and take certain sections in and out to actually help build it up. Now, we've got this um, shaker sample that we processed through the Tau Sampler plugin. So we use this very simply as an arrangement tool just to add extra interest. So at the front of this drum track, let's start right at the beginning. Let's say we take out the tier eight hats and the shaker. Leave the symbols where they are. And just copy through. And then it's gonna build up to a section where we can drop into the 808. And also whilst I'm doing this, let me show you some of the tricks that we've always liked to use just to help bridge some of the sections because the most important section of any arrangement are these bar lines. Now it's nice but we can certainly make that better. First thing I'm going to do is just copy an extra kick drum. I'm going to create a blank track straight underneath it, copy that kick drum onto the blank track and just pop uh, Ableton standard reverb on. Not even going to turn it up. For some reason this works really well in economy mode. Turn it all the way wet really long. So this is effectively just one track that's going to be a kick reverb. Even longer. So I'm just going to take some of the real sub off that and I'll show you why in a minute. a touch of mid-range. Now I'm actually going to freeze the track and this is a great tip in Ableton if you ever want to bounce anything down effectively, freeze it, click on it again and then hit flatten. Um, if you're wondering why we're using this particularly odd um, colour scheme as well it's just so that it will look good on the capture cameras. It is starting to freak me out a little bit I must admit. So how I did that was use freeze track and then once you have a frozen track, you have the ability within this submenu here to actually flatten it and turn it into a straight audio file. Now, one thing you may not be aware of in Ableton, that if I, say, consolidate this section here, or all of these kick drums, um, something quite odd will happen. It will actually normalize the audio that you're consolidating and then alter this gain control here. So let me show you what I mean. If I hit consolidate, you'll now notice that the new part that's created looks exactly the same level, but that's because it's actually been re-leveled down here in the clip gain. So it can be quite dangerous when you're consolidating sections because it does add a normalized process to it as well. If you want to consolidate all of this without any volume changes to your audio, just grab any plugin and stick it at the end, hit freeze again, and then flatten from the same menu that you've got freeze. Now, once it's flattened, obviously, you can still see all of the what are the original parts, but if you open it out, it is actually now one completely solid audio file. But the beauty of it is it's been rendered without any of the normalization. And to me, that's some of the best, uh, the, the, uh, kind of really nice non-destructive tip for using Ableton. So I've created a new channel here and copied our kick reverb. I'm going to take most of the bass end off on this one. So it's a lot lighter 
And now I'm going to grab a compressor, side chain that compressor off the main kick. Another great little tip whilst you're arranging in Ableton is the duplicate command. Whatever time you have selected on the arrange page, whether it be blank or contain parts, you can actually just duplicate it straight in like that. And that was just Apple D on the uh, Mac, and I think it's Control D on a PC. So once again, now we're starting to get into the processing. I've just rolled some of the bass off this. Let's also fatten it up with the reviver. And I'm going to want a frozen version of that. So once again, making the decision, instead of just kind of leaving all the plugins running, I'm saying, no, I'm happy with the sound of that. I'm going to freeze it and burn it into an audio file and then start working. And this is our section that we've made there. So let's just duplicate that to all other places. There's one other effect I just want to pick up here. It's quite nice to have something even while we're just on the drum sounds before we're starting to build any kind of effects, is to use them to send off into reverbs or delay. So I'm going to grab the clap end of that loop just onto a separate channel. And this is our separate channel here. We'll say clap verb. And just make sure that we take the end off. And then once again, let's chuck that into an enormous reverb. Completely wet, so once again, it's parallel almost, in, uh, even though it's on its own separate channel, but it's in parallel to the original sound, which means we have more control over it. So very quickly, just from using just the, even just the samples that we've already put in there, we've already got the beginnings of a drum arrangement. And let me play you back these last four bars, you'll see what I mean. Okay, so now the fun starts. We can really start to think about this as an actual, almost drum composition. <laughs> Great. So hopefully you enjoyed that. And stick around because part three is coming very soon. In part three, James is gonna look at recording some effects with the classic Pro One synthesizer, as well as putting some finishing touches to the mix of the drums. And remember, if you wanna learn more about mixing and mastering, make sure you check out our courses pointblanklondon.com. We'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>